92.1 WROI, WROI FM.com. We are streaming audio live on RTC Channel 5 and tape video on RTC Channel 4. Hi, Scott. Hello again. Hey, Scott's got his own coffee cup here at the radio station. <laughs> and if you have a smartphone or an Android, you can download the TuneIn Radio app. Take us wherever you happen to be going. Pleased to be joined in the studio by the President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, Mr. John Alley. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Hey, it's always a pleasure to be here. Any fishermen out by the pond this We're morning? We're seeing some activity out by that. the pond. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen any fish coming out, but I've seen a lot of worms <laughs> going in. There so. you go. It's picking up as we get warm weather. Well, nice day today, so we'll probably have a few folks out there as yep. the day goes and on. I think, uh, you know, in time, there's been past, I've seen some fairly nice fish come out of that okay. pond, so I, you know, there's always hope. I think you catch one, you'll drown 30 more worms just to try to catch just another one. Just to catch one. another one, yes. that's exactly right. Board was in session yesterday. Yes, had our board meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, again, fairly quick board meeting. We're, we're kind of getting pretty efficient at those. Did have some items, some critical items that we brought to the board that needed their approval. And, you know, our process is, uh, you know, if it's a major acquisition, major purchase, we want to make sure the board's on board, so to speak. And uh, so we always go through them for the large purchases, get their blessing and let them know why we're doing it and what we need to be done. And so we had three items came to the board yesterday. Uh, the biggest items probably were was three items. It was called our life packs. And those are the units that are in our crash cart. So, you know, if there's a cardiac event, these are the things that we can monitor and you know we've all seen clear in the, in the shock so the th we've got three of them that are pretty well at end of life and what happens the manufacturer tells us once we've stopped production of that particular unit we'll support it for seven years we're there on, on these three units okay. so you know they still work but if we have a part that goes wrong with them or something breaks they no longer support it and we can't get parts so you know it's just time we have to replace those so the board did approve purchase of three new life packs. We have one that's fairly new. It just needs a software upgrade. So we said, while we're buying these three, let's lump them together. So we're gonna upgrade one of those. So in the building here, uh, probably within the next 30 to 40 days, we'll have all new state-of-the-art life packs that go on all the crash carts. And that's that one piece of equipment you hope you never use, <laughs> but when you need it, we it's wanna make there. sure it's there. Are they expensive? They're very expensive. Uh, for the, the three units and the upgrade, we're talking about $40,000. Okay. So it, it's not a cheap piece of equipment, but it's very critical to a hospital environment. We wanna make sure we've got the best out there and that uh, you know it's gonna be now another probably 10 years, 15, before we need to replace them again. But let's just keep on top of it. Uh, I'm not very comfortable saying, you know, no parts available, let's go another year. <laughs> Uh, it's just not where we want to be. The other thing that we've brought into play here is uh, we've been looking at a new fracture table. So if you've had an orthopedic event, uh, say a hip or something, there are special tables that we have to use for that. We've been looking to replace our current one with another one. And then recently, Dr. Sheedy has done some uh, additional training on a new procedure, which is far less invasive on the patient. You have much quicker turnaround time as far as recovery less physical therapy, less hospital time. So that's another kind of special table. We was able to find a table that we can do both surgeries on. So we took that to the board and said, we were going to spend about $42,000 for this surgery table. Can I up it another 40,000 and buy the, the device that where we can do these, what's called anterior hip procedures. We've had a, a loaner table and we've done three of the procedures and the patients are, are very pleased. Um, I know one of those patients said, yes, she is very it, pleased. It's just, I yes. mean, your recovery time is dramatically cut because of the, how they do this procedure. It's a little different way of doing it. So uh, we said, can we go ahead and up that another 40000 go ahead and get the, the specialized table? And the board did approve that. So uh, that uh, order, I think, uh, was phoned in this morning. I know we're anxious to get that going. And along with that, there was another device that we can use. And anytime you have surgery, we're always concerned with blood loss. So in the past, they've used a device that basically black, kind of burns the vessels. There's a new product out there now that use uh, more of electronic and saline. So it creates like an electrical field and it's about 200 degrees cooler wow. than using the old method. So again, helps on that recovery time. So we did, uh, the board approved to do that. And again, that's another fairly expensive, about $40,000 for that device. But when you start thinking, you know, what's this gonna mean to the patients? A lot less downtime for exactly. this. And you know, anytime you're, you're, you're burning something, it takes longer to heal, whereas this now uses 
some different technology, some much cooler, so you heal quicker. So again, we're trying to figure out what can we do to keep up with that technology. Let's go serve the patients here in Fulton County. So, uh, you know, the table is going to be coming here pretty quick. I've asked my director of surgery, I think she's going to come with me next month. Uh, that way you can get an expert to talk about what this thing does. Love because to have her. It's, you know, this whole procedure is just phenomenal in what it does. And like you say, anybody that's had it, they, I mean, they just say that's the best way to do it. And uh, not everybody's a candidate right now. You know, they kind of pick and choose. It takes kind of a special person. But again, when we can reduce that recovery time, get you back on your feet, that's what we need to do. So well, patient care is what it's all about. Patient care is what it's all about. You know, and it's kind of a double-edged sword because you're going to be in my facility less, so I'm not going to be able to charge <laughs> as much. You know, I, again, but our business right. is to put ourselves out of business. Sure. To try and make people healthy, get them back on their feet. So it's going to be a, a very good investment for the organization for the county. So hopefully next month I'll have an expert with me that can kind of answer okay, a go. lot more questions. You know, and can kind of give a better timetable once the table's in, in place. You know, we'll have to probably do a little uh, getting it, you know, cleared through different biomedical, make sure that it's safe, even though it's a new table. We still inspect every piece of equipment that comes in to make sure that it is up to the standards it needs to be. And, uh, you know, you, you trust but verify. And uh, manufacturers, oh, it's good to go. I always want to verify that. So we have folks go through and they take a few days to basically relook at every device we bring in make sure it's going to be safe for patient care. So uh, excited about this Excellent. new procedure. Get it going here probably in the next couple months. And I know we've got some folks that have kind of on the wait list. They said, you know, I could do a traditional hip replacement now. Can I wait? Because I, I want to go to this new method. And uh, so it's really a good thing for the community. Right now, uh, Fort Wayne does it. I think Laporte does it in Indianapolis. So there's not a lot of okay. folks doing this procedure. We've, uh, Dr. Sheedy's done a, a lot of training. He went to Laporte and trained with a physician there who's done thousands of these procedures to get that technique down. We sent him to another training institute out west. He was out there a day or so just learning you know, how to do this because it is a, a new procedure and uh, so he's he's certified, ready to go, and very anxious to get started. Once we got through that we actually got into the financials for February and I was pretty pleased with how February turned out. Uh, again we were not meeting our goal of making everybody healthy. Uh, we had a lot of sick people in the hospital in the month of February. The flu really hit big. We saw a lot of it uh, you know, with uh, some inpatients. Had gross revenue about 10.8 million for the month. Uh, we wrote off about 6.7 million in our deductions and non-collectibles. So that left us about 4.8 million to, to spend for our operations. Our expenses was 4.2 million, so we uh, did have a $522,000 profit for the month. And the, you know, it's kind of exciting because we were anticipating about an $800,000 loss. That's what was our budget. Because we always know the first few months of the year, we usually, based on history, have a loss. So you know, we're actually over budget for the year. So that's nice to start off on that positive side. And hopefully, we can continue to grow with uh, spring break here these past exactly. this, this week could and be next a little week. Different for the yeah, month it's going to be a little slim right. for the month of March. We've got a lot of staff members going, a lot of physicians. And a lot of the community is out of town also. And you know, the either the good side or the bad side, we knew do know when they come back, they've been exposed <laughs> to some new bugs. Exactly. And we usually see a spike in folks coming in because they start, you know, kind of getting a little sick once they get back here. Hopefully nobody brings Zika back with them. I hope I, I I'm hoping <laughs> we don't see where they're that. going in Where the South. they're going, yes. Right. One of the other things the board wasn't real happy to hear is uh, there's been some changes in some regulations. And in the past, the board was required by some of our regulatory agencies, they have to review all the non-clinical policies. And it, the concept there is they want to make sure there's somebody, they kind of call it a lay person, reviewing those administrative non-clinical. Regulation came out this year, they have to now review every policy, oh, clinical, wow. non-clinical. And a couple of the board members says, so I'm supposed to read about where you place electrodes, you know, for a, for a test. I don't know that. And we understand that, but that's one of the new regulations. So we've got probably in excess of 2,000 policies and procedures that has to be approved this year. So, uh, you know, I had like five board members. I don't know if they could resign. I said, no, uh, you know, they're going to have to do this. And it's, uh, it's a daunting task. Sure and uh, by the time it gets to the board, the good thing is it's been looked at by about four different sets right. of eyes. We have a lot of people, you know, reviewing them, tweaking them. It goes to another committee to review, it goes to medical staff for review. So there's been a lot of reviews to make sure our policies are, you know, what we need to do. 
And then we have folks come in and say, okay, here's your policy. It says you're going to do A, B, C. We have to prove this, that that's what we did. So uh, they, they were anxious to get started on all those 2,000 policies. That's why the meeting was so short. Right? That was short, yeah. They, they said they need to go rest up so they can start reading all these meetings. Um, we are going to, next month's meeting will be moved up a week. It will be April 19th instead of the 26th. Um, I will be out of out of the hospital that that following week uh, attending a conference on uh, you know some of the health care reform issues that we're going to be looking at coming forward so it's usually a good thing to go and kind of get a preview of what we're going to see next two to three years down the road and then after that one of the things that uh, you know kind of new it came in January of this year it's called the caregiver advise record and enable act or we just call it the care act and what that tells us is as a patient in the hospital you can designate somebody to be your caregiver and by that designation now we share with them you know you're at home what you're going to need at home it's not required that you do that but if you do come in and say hey I want you know my spouse my daughter my next door neighbor to be my caregiver when I'm released then that gives us the ability to sit down with them and go over you know what we're treating you how you need to be treated at home and stuff like that and this kind of gets what is called that patient engagement. We're wanting to get a little more feedback from the patients. And, you know, the government is saying, you know, the more involved you are in your own health care, the more likely it's going to work. So this is just one of those steps where we want to make sure that you're comfortable with the information you get when you go home. And the, what we've seen in the past is when you're in the hospital, you want to go home. So we're sitting there trying to tell you all these discharge instructions and all you're hearing is blah, 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 blah. I want to go home. <laughs> So now by having another person there helping you listen, then when you do get home, if they have questions, you have questions, we got a contact person, they can call back and say, you know, I, I remember talking about this, but I'm not clear. So I think it's going to make that transition from inpatient to home much smoother and allows us to have that ability to talk to folks. Because in the past, we couldn't really share your medical information because of federal regulations. Yeah, so this sure. eases it up a little bit. I think it's going to be a, a lot nicer for some of the folks who are just confused by everything we throw at them as, as we're trying to get them discharged and head for home. Along with that, John, you can also check your medical records online through the Woodlawn portal. Through lab. the portals, right. correct. And, uh, you know, we do, we're seeing more and more communication not only with the hospital, but with the physician practices. They have a portal there also where you can kind of just go online, send a question in, It'll get to the provider. You know, it might take a couple days because, again, we get a lot of those. But again, you can communicate back and forth. You can go online, and if you had some recent tests, we post those out onto the portal. Okay. So, you know, if you're not signed up for that portal, get with your healthcare provider, your physician, or come to the hospital, and we can get a person to sit down with you and kind of give you how to get signed up so you can get in online. But a lot of times, Woodlawn will actually send that out to you if you are a patient of one of the Woodlawn physicians, correct? Correct. And yeah. then the, you'll, that'll pop up if you've given them your email address. Right. And then it's just a matter of logging on. Just to log that. on, right. get, establish your password, and then you can get in and, and review medical uh, notes that's in your file, test results, it's all out there in that portal. So it's a nice tool. A lot of folks don't like using it. We're trying to encourage more and more people to do that because, again, it gets you engaged right. into your health care. You're better informed. The more informed you are, the better questions you have. And we don't mind questions. You know, that that's if you have a question, a concern, don't understand something, please get with us. And we don't have to worry about the doctor's handwriting, right? Don't. I wasn't going to go there, but now you brought that up. That's, you know, I think that is an issue because uh, I don't know how many folks have tried to read some doctor's handwriting. Sometimes I've had doctors that don't, can't read their own handwriting. So this does solve that issue sure. where it's, you know, now it's uh, we're requiring them to type it in. It's much easier to read. Exactly. Okay. Any other notes from the board meeting? That was pretty well our whole the okay. board meeting. Let me ask you this question. We uh, we are in the news right now with the, the Brussels Belgium thing, and not that that would ever happen in Rochester, Indiana, but in the event of an emergency, uh, be it a, a strong storm or something, Woodlawn prepared for that. We're right? prepared for that. Okay. And, you know, one of the things that we're required to do by again a lot of the governmental agencies is we have to have disaster drills at least four a year. So we try to pick different scenarios. Uh, in the past, we was able to do what was called a tabletop, where we just gather everybody together and say, okay, if this happens, how do we do that? How do we do this? They've kind of changed that. They said, no longer tabletops. We want you to actually go through a mock disaster. So this will be the first year where we'll actually be doing that, where we'll call the disaster in-house. Uh, we have call lists of employees aren't in the building. We have a, a mechanism where we start calling them, have them come in. 
Uh, we've got a disaster, uh, as we discussed, kind of our war room, so to speak, that we've got extra supplies, we've got contacts, so we know our vendors and after hour numbers. So if all of a sudden we see we're going to have a big influx of patients coming in, we can call some of our supply vendors after hours, we got an emergency number, okay. and we can have a truck of supplies heading our direction that next morning. So, you know, that's the stuff we practice. Um, staff is great at it. it uh, you know, you, you practice and you practice, and unfortunately, a few times we've actually had to institute, you know, some of our disasters because we've had a true emergency come up, and it's it's amazing. They actually do better in the real life than they do in, in the in the drill. And it's, you know, you basically, you play how you train. Sure. So we train hard, and because what we want that to be, if there is a disaster, whether it's, you know, a storm, who knows what could happen, I'd rather those folks just, all of a sudden, it just kicks into kind of an autopilot. And you can see that, you know, during the drills, we're busy writing notes, and you know, because we have to document everything we did. But when it's for real, it's amazing how the folks just, they know what needs to be done, and it, it goes actually smoother everything just fits into place. So the staff is tremendously effective in those emergencies. We've got the food, we've got emergency power, uh, we've got sources so if we lose our water supply we have sources where we can get uh, water tanked into us. One of the things that uh, we have here, the, the advantage is we have two electrical feeds into the hospital. A main feed comes from the north and one comes from the south. So if there would be something north of us where we'd lose electrical lines we have a switch, we can now switch our power to come in from a south feed. So there's a lot of things that uh, goes on and we have to test those feeds quite often. We'll turn one off, turn the other on, just to make sure those, those circuits do work. So there's a lot that goes on behind right, the scenes exactly. as far as this emergency preparedness. Um, you know, a lot of our agencies that inspect us, they have two to three chapters just on how prepared are you. So we've got books and, and there's certain ways we do things. We document every time we run our generator. You know, we test it weekly to make sure if we need ger generator power, it's there. And it actually kicks in, we shut power off, and you don't really notice it in the hospital. It's a pretty seamless process, so we're up on emergency power. So very, you know, glad that we're there. We hope we never have to use exactly. it. And, uh, you know, are some things not gonna be like normal? Absolutely. But I think we're prepared to handle pretty well any type of a disaster emergency that we would see in this area. Could Woodlawn be a secondary provider? Let's say there was an emergency that happened in the Kokomo area or Pulaski County area that overflowed their hospital? Absolutely. And we do that a lot too. We'll actually be in radio contact because what we assume, if there's going to be a major disaster, we're going to lose phone lines. So now we have 800 megahertz radios that's within our northern region. So now I can get on the radio and call any other hospital and say, okay, here's our resources. And that's what we'll do. We'll say, you know, we've got X number of beds available. We got this. We start sharing resources. So if they start getting overrun, then we're, the overflow would come to us. And same thing here. If all of a sudden we get a, a large, you know, group of patients come in, we have that ability to contact other hospitals and say, what is your capacity? What do you have available? And now we can start shipping patients to those other facilities. And that's something, you know, again, we practice that uh, you know, with the other hospitals in the area on a fairly frequent basis to make sure what are your resources. Okay. And, uh, you know, you try to plan for, we think we've got everything figured out. I'm sure that there's something we might have missed, but pretty confident, you know, because of the, the radios and cell phones, we have multiple avenues of communication where we can talk to other facilities if we need to, and we do practice that and make sure that those communication lines do work. Last thing I'd like to talk with you about, uh, this is kind of important uh, also, especially since we're in the throes of it, but it's the Affordable Care Act, and you have folks out there for folks who don't have insurance that want to find out more about it that can take them through that process. Yes. It's, and it is a process. It is a process. It's uh, If you're not familiar with it, it's very overwhelming to, to look at an application, and it's 18 to 20 pages long. Um, you know, you can just say, you get three pages in, say, I can't do this anymore. So we have teamed up with uh, a company that comes in, they have an office in our building, and they will walk you through that company, it's called ClaimAid, they'll help you through that process, and what we're finding is they almost will do 99% of that for you. You might have to provide some small documentation, but they'll fill out those applications for you. It's working real well, the, the young ladies on, you know, in the office, if we have a patient come into the ER that's submitted upstairs, 
and they identify, yeah, we don't have insurance, she'll go to either the ER, she'll go up to their patient room and say, do you have some time, can we talk? Helps them start that enrollment process. As we move down the road, then they do have insurance of some sort. And the, you know, we've, we kind of look at that on from the hospital. I, historically, we were writing off anywhere from four to $700,000 per month in you know, uncollectible charges because folks just didn't have insurance. Percentage was pretty high. So it was real high. We're probably looking now three to 400000 So we've seen about a $200,000 per month decrease in the amount of those write-offs because we have more people enrolled, they have insurance, and, you know, that just helps the hospital because, you know, that allows us now to invest in the surgery tables, the life packs, because that's where whatever profit the hospital makes, we turn it back into needed services for the community. And so, you know, long term we benefit from more folks having that insurance. And it's just working really well. Uh, the young lady is doing it. It's very well received. Everybody really likes talking to her. And she helps you get through that process because it, it's, it can be daunting if you... She out there every day, John? She's there four days a week. Okay. Uh, call right. the switchboard, I suppose, if you want to. Yeah, just call the switchboard. Sure. And her office is right next to the switchboard, okay. you know, where you Excellent. come in, the, the visitor entrance, uh, kind of the switchboard reception right. area. Her office is right there, uh, easy to get to, and uh, just does a wonderful job getting folks enrolled and getting them in the insurance market that they need to be in. John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Have we pretty well covered it today? I think we've right. pretty well covered it. Keep the community healthy, will you please? We're trying. All right, John, thanks very much. Thank you.